Hello. In this video, I'm going to recap some of what we talked about in the last video and, um, and then show you what we can do with these rate laws. Okay. So in the last video, we were in this one, we're talking about free radical polymerization. It's kinetics. So we saw where these rate laws come from, rate of initiation, rate of propagation, rate of termination. And we discussed the steady state assumption and how important it is. Remember, the concentration of radicals or cations or anions is difficult to, to measure experimentally. It's not something that's easily tracked as a function of time. So if there's a way we can get this out of our equations, we want to do it. And we do that by the steady state assumption. And what's really great is how well the steady state assumption works. So um, the steady state assumption says that the concentration of the active species, the free radical, the anion, the cation, is not changing with time. So how do we put that into an equation? The rate of initiation is forming the radicals or anions or cations, and the rate of termination is killing the radicals or anions or cations. So if we're going to be at steady state, these two rates have to be equal. Otherwise, if, this, if rate of initiation is bigger, our concentration of free radicals is going to be growing with time. If it's going to be at steady state, if the concentration isn't changing with time, Ri, the rate of initiation, has to equal Rt, the rate of termination. So now it's simple algebra. We set Ri equal to Rt, and we can solve for the concentration of radicals. And if these three rate laws were different, we'd still do the exact same thing, okay? All right, so now what we're going to do is talk about the rate of polymerization. Okay, so our rate of polymerization equals our rate of propagation. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody, right? Because the rate of polymerization is the rate at which the chain grows, the rate at which it propagates. So our rate of polymerization, which we always use a capital RP, equals our rate of propagation, which is a lowercase RP, which equals this, right? This part would be given. And we're looking at the decrease in monomer concentration with respect to time. So now we know what our active species concentration is from doing the steady state assumption, and we just need to plug that in. Okay, so our rate of polymerization equals Kp, the rate constant for polymerization, times the radical concentration, which is Fkd, initiator concentration, over kt all to the one half power times the monomer concentration. Okay. And remember it equals to minus dm dt in case we wanted to look at concentration as a function of time, right? Okay, so now we need to think about what changes with time. What changes with time? Our initiator concentration and our monomer concentration. This changes with time and this changes with time. Okay. If you go back to page nine, you can see this, this equation is given. So the decrease in initiator concentration with respect to time equals Kd times the initiator concentration. Now, if you go back and look at page one, this equation is exactly the same as the equation for radioactive decay. So we've already solved that equation. So if we do that, again, we get the initiator concentration equals the initial initiator concentration times e to the minus kdt. So we can now readily plug that in to our rate of polymerization. Okay. <clears throat> So we have Kp Fkd over Kt to the one half. Um, I'm going to put that in brackets. Those are all constants, right? Now I have 
the monomer concentration times the initial initiator concentration to the one half. times e to the minus k d t divided by 2. So I've got things in, in three brackets here, and I skipped some algebra, but just remember i was to the 1 half power. That's why we got 1, one half here and, one, and the divided by 2 here. Okay? All right, so there is an equation for the rate of polymerization. And now, what changes with time? The monomer concentration and time, right? T equals time, okay? So we can separate the variables and integrate this, right? Because it equals minus dm dt. So we can separate the variables and integrate that. Okay, but first what we're gonna do, this is the same equation I had on the last page. First what we're gonna do is look at these. Um, these three terms um, that I have grouped and um, think about what it means. Let's, and we're going to do them backwards. Let's look at this, this final one. So this is an exponential. So this tells us the rate of polymerization is going to slow down in an exponential fraction because the initiator is being consumed. So we have less initiator so our reaction will slow with time. Okay, now let's look at the second term. At the initial stages of the reaction, the rate of polymerization is proportional to the monomer concentration times the initiator concentration to the one-half power, right? So, and this is true because at the initial stages, the monomer concentration hasn't really changed and the initiator concentration hasn't really changed. So if we plot RP versus the monomer concentration times the initiator concentration, we should get a straight line. It is a straight line. Our assumptions are correct. The steady state assumption is a good assumption in the initial stages of the reaction. So what assumptions did we make to get the equation above? I just gave away the big one. We made the steady state assumption. We also assume that reactivity is independent of chain length, and that's implicit in the rate laws, right? Because we only have one rate law for propagation. That rate law didn't change, the rate constant didn't change as a function of chain length, okay? Okay, now let's look at this collection of constants, okay? So FKD, that's just related to the initiator. We could change the initiator and change that. But KP over KT to the one half, okay? The rate of polymerization is proportional to KP over KT. So let's think about a free radical polymerization of ethylene, 130 degrees C and one bar. KP over KT is 0.05, much less than one. What is that telling us? It's telling us that the rate constant for termination is greater than propagation. It's going to terminate faster than it propagates. So will polymer be formed? No, right? Okay, now let's look. We slightly increase the temperature, but we really increase the pressure. What happens now? Kp over Kt to the one half equals three. Do you think we'll form polymer this time? Sure we will right? Because the rate of propagation, the rate constant of propagation is much bigger than termination. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about when our, um, our assumptions start to fall apart. So there's an effect called the Tromsdorf effect. And what happens this effect is important when the viscosity of the solution increases. As the viscosity of the solution increases, the rate of termination decreases. Why? Think about it. So the rate of termination decreases because the rate of diffusion, the ability of these huge polymer chains to find one another and terminate. Think about how we terminate with free radical polymerization. We terminate by 
we terminate by the chain ends coming together and combining or the chain ends coming together and having a disproportionation reaction. So those chain ends have to find each other. If the chains are so big and the viscosity is so high, the rate of termination starts to go to zero. But the initiators are small molecules. The monomers are small molecules. So the rate of initiation doesn't really change, even though the viscosity goes up. So the viscosity goes up the rate of a lot, the rate of termination goes down, but the rate of initiation does not go up. Okay, so what happens to the rate of polymerization? Rate of polymerization is proportional to Kp over Kt. So as the viscosity goes up, what happens? Kt is going to zero, what happens? We can literally blow up the lab. And you remember me talking about the ICI guys um, when we were talking about um, polyethylene synthesis. Um, that's probably what happened to them. As the viscosity went up, this reaction ran out of control and they blew up their reactor. Okay, So that's the Tromsdorf effect. Okay, now Again, I told you, we can take our rate of polymerization, which, e which is the rate of decrease of the monomer concentration with respect to time. We can integrate, we can separate the variables and integrate and, um, and go through that calculus in algebra. Um, none of it's hard, it's just uh, a little bit tedious. So we've got one over m dm so 1 over x dx equals the natural log, right? We did that before. Okay, again, these are all constants. And then we've got e to the, e to the minus x, essentially, kd. So then we've got to go through that calculus. Um, any calculus that's um, got an exponential or something like that, if it was an exam, I would give you the appropriate um, uh, integral table because I don't remember those. Um, anyway, so we can you can go through this this math and this calculus, and now you've got the natural log of the monomer concentration as a function of time. This is not an easy equation to look at. It doesn't give me a lot of insight into what's going on, but we can plot it, um, raise both equations to the E, and then plot it and plot concentration as a function of time and look at it compared to real data. By convention, people don't just talk about conversion. They talk, uh, uh, they, they, put things into terms of conversion. It's sort of like extent of reaction. So the degree of conversion is the fraction of monomer that's been converted into polymer. How would the degree of conversion be expressed as an equation? Okay, so here's the fraction of monomer that's been converted into polymer. Okay, so there's our equation. There's, there's it when we isolate, we separate, um, we isolate the monomer concentration. So our conversion equals this. This does not help me a lot unless I plot it, which I have on the next page. We can also think about what's the maximum conversion as t goes to infinity, and we can figure out what that number is. So if we look at a plot, here's our equation for a cur uh, uh, conversion. Um, this is real data. This is polymerization versus, or you know, degree of conversion versus time. And these first three curves um, follow this equation nearly perfectly. Okay, so when the concentration of the uh, methylmethacrylate monomer is below 50%, the experimental data follows this equation really well. But it doesn't at higher concentrations. Why? What happens to make real data deviate from what we derived? It means our assumptions have gone bad. So something has gone wrong. So our two assumptions were that reactivity was independent of chain length 
and that the steady state assumption was valid. So that the rate of initiation equals the rate of termination. So what do you think is happening at high concentrations of monomer? The viscosity is going up. So the rate of termination is going down. So the steady state assumption is falling apart and the real data deviates dramatically from our predicted curve. I also have the max conversion um, shown here, right? So this is this, that's this equation plotted. And if we converted 100%, that would be there, but we're down here more at this blue line. So what is this curve showing us? The main takeaway is that because we consume the initiator, we're never gonna polymerize all of the polymer, uh, all of the monomer, right? We have a maximum conversion of monomer to polymer, and that's based on the consumption of the initiator. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna cover in these slides. Um, and the next topic is gonna be the kinetic chain length, and that will be much shorter, okay? Our next and final topic will be the kinetic chain length.